Carol Dorman. Thank everyone again for coming. I want to let everyone know that this is Elise Bernhardt. Elise is the head of the Foundation for Jewish Culture, who is instrumental in having this film funded and is a very important part of the Jewish cultural scene right now. And I'm going to turn most of this over. I think most of the questions are probably going to be for Belle. And I think most people know here that she's 100 years old this year. <laughs> amazing accomplishment I hope to have in my own belt one day, that the real reason she should be applauded is she's a remarkable writer and person and uh, has been a great ambassador for her grandfather for many, many years. And so it's not the age that matters, it's the person. So uh, I'm sure that you can well, uh, I'm going to give you plenty of time for questions. And well, we have a chair for you if you'd like to sit. Um, so that you can entertain questions comfortably. Do you prefer sitting down or standing? Standing. Okay. She wants well, to stand. Not quite. Yeah. Then no chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, we spend a lot of time at the Foundation for Jewish Culture wrestling with the question of what is Jewish culture. And I just said to Joe that we need not only to send this film to everyone in the world who's remotely curious, but the transcripts as well. Um, I did have the great fortune of rereading your book. I had the great fortune of rereading Bell's book, Up the Down Staircase, which I show of hands how many people have read that book. <laughs> okay, so if you haven't read it recently, read it again. Um, can you talk about channeling? Because your grandfather clearly channeled the, the voices of the folks around him, and I had the sensation that you channeled the teachers and students who you got to work with when you wrote that book. So is there any thing that your grandfather gave you that, or was that just out of your own imagination?
we spoke Russian because that was the language of the cities in which we lived. Kiev, Odessa, Moscow. But we understood Yiddish and we were his first audience. When he finished the story, he got dressed up in a special tie and jacket. And we all said, Papa, finish the story. We tried to sit as close to him as possible. We were his first audience. And I was very, very happy that I had a Papa who was not like any other grandfather. But who he was to us now and at that wonderful film that we saw, I had no idea. He was just a lot of fun. And I loved him very much. I'm going to take some questions from the audience. If you have any questions? No questions. Okay. Uh, in the, uh -huh. I have one in the back. Uh, Ms. Kaufman, when did you come to America and were you treated at all specially being the granddaughter, Shalom Aleichem, when you, when you <laughs> came to America? When I came to America, I was not treated in any special way because Shalom Aleichem was my grandfather. I was scared, skinny, hungry, 12 year old who lived through the Russian Revolution. I knew that Shalom Aleichem was a great writer. I loved his model, the Katrasan stories. I identified with it. I read it in a Russian translation. We understood Yiddish. We did not read or write it. Russian was our language. But I forgot your question. <laughs> 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 Is any effort done around the world to revive Yiddish language and to to enjoy this beautiful culture which we lost actually? Music, songs, everything, all uh, jokes, everything Jewish culture, which by accepting Hebrew as a major language, we lost Yiddish culture. Is any effort is done around the world to maintain? Yiddish as a language. Well, that's a very big topic. And I'm not young enough to answer it. But, but he loved Yiddish. And even though he knew Russian perfectly, he loved the Yiddish Mama Russia. A sort of kitchen language. And he raised it to the level of literature. A Hebrew, well, that's a long time. I mean, I'll, I'll just say very briefly that um, there are, I, I, to, I mean, there are obviously the Hasidic communities in Brooklyn, I think people know in other places, use, use Yiddish as their everyday language. Aside from that, there are increasingly more, I think, programs, Yiddish programs in the United States. Young people have gravitated back toward Yiddish and Yiddish literature um, in ever larger numbers. But the idea of there ever being a Yiddish culture again, I think is a virtual impossibility because a culture and a language like that needs a, a space, and that space no longer exists. Well, I, I'll just say one thing, two things. Um, I know Los Angeles has something called Yiddish Kite. I know that Aaron Lansky, who you hear from in this film, has done an enormous amount to restore. Um, we're doing an American Academy in Jerusalem through the foundation, and one of our uh, fellows is a playwright who is looking at the resurgence of Yiddish in Israel. And there's a, a whole upsurge in Yiddish happening now, both in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. So I wouldn't, I think a space is being made again 
And uh, of course that's happening in places like Poland and Germany where they realize that they want to restore what they got rid of. Uh, question over there. For the director, um, can you talk about where you got some of the historical footage? Yeah. Especially the pogrom images? Yeah. Um, the, the I got uh, footage and photos from a number of sources. The footage, for the most part, uh, came from the Evo Institute. I assume most people here would know what Evo is. Uh, for those who don't, it's an organization founded in Vilna uh, pre-war to preserve and record and study Euro uh, East European Jewish history, which is now in New York, a great institution. What's interesting about that footage is that most of it comes from home movies. And they're home movies of wealthy Jews from the 20s and 30s who uh, wanted to go back to the old country and visit the old shtetl and their family. So what you, what, what, in each of those roles, what you don't see here are images of wealthy homes and very wealthy, natally dressed Jews going over on very expensive ocean liners and then coming back to the shtetl. I cut out all the ocean liners and the fancy stuff that I left in the shtetl Jews. But they themselves are a remarkable document about the relationship between new and old world culture and provided this amazing, amazing footage I could use. One more question for Val. Go ahead. American Jew famous by trying to come back to the proofs where they came. I just ask you personally if you could, can you try to find out shtetl when your grandfather died? Have you been to Odessa? Have you seen what's uh, in the area near Kiev? What's going on now? Yes, I have been back in Pereslav. Pereslav was a little town about an hour and a half by car from Kiev, where Shalom Aleich was born. Very few people there left, very few Jews. We were met by the mayor of the town. It was extraordinary to walk on the same ground where Papa Shalom Aleichem walked, to sit on the same stone stoop where he once sat. We were treated as if we had descended from heaven. <laughs> it was a very touching experience. And I was back where I was brought up in Odessa during the revolution. Everything has changed and is changing. And that's so interesting for someone who's a hundred years old. <laughs> I wish I could have another 50. <laughs> because in the next 50 years, there will be such remarkable changes in technology, in global communication, in, in, in everything. Well, I won't live another 50, but I hope to live long enough to see you again. Thank you.